Is it over yet? You're not making sense. An unfortunate mistake. Leaving ashes. Last I read, you were recording something in Nashville last year. Uh, so, uh, what's coming up next? Is it the uh, imposter syndrome part two or? We're kind of. Um, 2020 was just kind of crazy um, for everybody, obviously. Um, I don't think anybody that's alive right now has experienced a global pandemic like, you know, we're seeing right now. And um, we just happened to be in the studio in February. It was completely coincidental. Um, we had made a plan to do a, like an album's worth of material. And um, yeah, I want to say it was like three or four days after we wrapped on imposter syndrome and part one and two. Uh, was the lockdown order in the states so it, it was kind of crazy because you know you I'm sure you noticed um, as a lot of us did like a lot of these artists that you know their touring schedules were canceled they there was like this brief period where people were like what are we doing like it, our show's coming back are they not coming back is this going to be a month thing is it going to be a six month thing like we nobody knew what was going on so you know people I feel like there was this like little phase where people were just like what the hell is going on what do we do and we inadvertently skipped that not because like we were ahead of anybody but because we had just happened to finish recording those two works before this all happened so as soon as that happened we didn't go into the like let's go into the studio and write stuff because we had just done that. So we we kind of just shifted our focus and we're like, well, shows aren't going to happen for a while. So let's just be as productive as we can. And that's kind of what led to us doing all the covers that we did last year and like um, the, the extra, like the collaborative track we did with Dropout Kings and Blue Pill and um, just that, that kind of stuff. We just we had already been in this like hustle, hustle, hustle mentality before the, the, the lockdown occurred. So we were, we just kind of decided to keep that going through the year. So to answer your question, um, imposter syndrome part two comes out in April and that's essentially been done since last February. We've just been waiting for the right time to put it out and have the music videos and the resources to push it and, and all that stuff. But, uh, in, in, uh, November, we went to Nashville and we worked with uh, Joey from the U's and uh, Jack from sleeping with sirens and a couple other people out in Nashville, as well as Bayless, the guy that produced imposter syndrome part one and two. And we essentially recorded a third EP for the year. Um, and I won't like spoil how it's going to come out, but um, we're, we're very well laced with new content and material throughout 2021. Like we're, um, all that material is recorded, I guess you could say. We're not we're not really like planning to hit the studio in any near time because we we spent all last year in the studio preparing for this year. Okay, you mentioned uh, uh, cover songs, and one of last year's covers was "Paper Cuts" uh, from uh, Australian rapper Illy. And uh, you seem to have a knack for kind of out of the box covers. So uh, where does that come from? Thank you. Um, well super early on in our our career um the whole like pop goes punk thing kind of started picking up like uh i i think fearless records was was who put that out but at, at a certain point in time uh on youtube that was just like the thing to do was for for bands like us like heavier like core sounding bands to cover like a pop song and um at the very beginning of our career Lady Gaga was like just starting to pop off with the fame and um, we covered Bad Romance, like one of the first things we ever did as a band. And it was a really big catalyst for kind of opening some doors for us, like because a lot of people that didn't really like listen to our kind of music heard that cover and were like, oh, this is kind of cool. Or vice versa, people that um, did listen to our kind of music, but didn't like you know, Lady Gaga or pop music, they were like, I don't like Lady Gaga, but I like this version of the song. So we, we kind of like realized pretty early on that we, we like doing that. We don't like to overdo it. And I kind of feel like last year we did a little bit just because we were so complacent from not touring. But um, I, I like 
bringing like our sensibilities to songs that we like to listen to that paper cuts uh song in particular is kind of an interesting deal because right now we're, we're not signed to a record label but we do have uh an investment financial partner and um when we were putting together the deal with him to you know get the assets and um, marketing supplies that we need to push uh this music he suggested that we do a cover because he had like look you know he'd done his homework on the band and he had seen that we had had a couple covers that had had some traction and um he suggested that we add that to the deal so we were like all right cool i mean we we really just wanted to do an album and you know if, if all it took to do an album was to do another cover to appease this guy we were so, so down to do it because we'd probably do it anyway and um this guy isn't like a music industry guy at all he's just like um a guy that's probably it, this is just like an investment to him you know like it's like a interesting investment he's not booking or putting money into stocks and stuff he's putting in money into something that's like super volatile like a band so it's interesting for him and you know we we have this like uh back and forth between the the two of us where we we kind of work on an almost day-to-day -day level so it's it's like kind of something that's interesting for him and then it's like very beneficial to us but somewhere along the negotiations he he be, he's actually from Australia, I guess I should mention. And uh, he uh, had heard some of our covers and he was just like, you know, I think that you guys would do a great job of this song. And he, he sent it to us and he was just like, you know, nobody knows about this song in America, but it's like four times platinum in, in Australia. So um, he was like, I think that a lot of people who hear it, when they hear this song, it'll be for the first time as your cover. And they'll just hear it differently than people in Australia would hear it. So we listened to the song and we were, we felt like we could do a pretty decent job covering it. And that's just kind of how it came together. It was, it's kind of cool because it's the first time I think in our entire career that somebody else has like made a suggestion for us to like do a cover. And we were just like, all right. <laughs> okay. You also put out the quarantine sessions in last April and uh, there was, for example, there was an uh, acoustic version of uh, Ghost of You that just came out a couple of months earlier in January. So was the quarantine sessions like your first reaction to what was happening or what was that? Yeah, um, it it was just kind of crazy because, um, you know, when we when we shot that video, things were just the, the Ghost of You acoustic video that it, things were just starting to like lockdown. And it was the first thing that we had to be like, I don't know, think about getting everybody in the same room, but it was like different than than normal because it was, you know, like we're, we're like thinking how many people are going to be in the room? Is it going to be less than six people? You know, think things like that, that we weren't norm used to like, uh, like considering, I guess. And um, we, we recorded that, that acoustic version of Ghost of You and we were trying to figure out how we could put it out. And um, along the lines before we started dropping songs from imposter syndrome, uh, we reached a point with our former record label where they were ready to release our masters from our previous albums back to the band. And that required us um, pulling everything down from, or them pulling everything down from their distribution and then us re-uploading it to our distribution. So there was like a brief period of time where like masks and struggle got pulled down from distribution. It was only like a couple of days, but um, as I was re-uploading all of those songs, I got to Fever Frenzy and I remembered that we had done an acoustic or I guess a piano rendition of the song when, when Casey was still in the band. And we always loved it, but because of the situation that we had with our, our record label, they that was kind of a single that wasn't, part of our recording agreement we just did it because we wanted to make more songs so the, the label didn't really like push it for us and therefore they never put out the the uh the piano version of the song and um you know with the loom incoming like imposter syndrome stuff and it being somewhat of a dynamic change from some of our past works um that's kind of how that came to be but it, it was just kind of us experiencing um the quarantine in the moment and like it, it was new to everybody you know and a lot of times in in difficult times uh people will look to people they admire artists or 
influencers or, or whatever for guidance of times. And this kind of just like swept everybody off their feet at the same time. And I don't know. I mean, it was a very small gesture, but it was just kind of like my way and the band's way of being like, I don't really know what to tell you right now, but like, <laughs> here's something, you know, like, like, you know, we're, we're in it together. And like, I, I just wanted to put out something that was indicative of the moment so that people would feel that like we were all experiencing it together, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And of course, uh, like you already said, the imposter syndrome part one came in July and that was already done in February then. So, uh, the, uh, COVID didn't really affect that. So, uh, for that album, so, uh, where did the inspiration and, uh, come for the music and lyrics? Um, well, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the circumstances that led to, to me becoming the vocalist of the band, but essentially, uh, in November or October, actually of 2019 we were scheduled to do a tour um and we were it was like a tour that kind of wound its way with another tour and we were playing several shows with uh slaves and we had been for quite some time trying to work our way in with slaves booking agent because he's a really awesome guy really awesome booking agent and somebody that could foreseeably open uh touring opportunities for us and he had kind of like gone out on a limb and got us these these shows with slaves so we, we felt very obligated to play them you know canceling them wasn't exactly an option or it could potentially jeopardize our um potential situation with this booking agent that we were trying to get in with um so like a week before the tour our old vocalist trevor just like to keep it short just sent us a, a message that said that he'd be unable to do the tour and regardless of what that meant for the future he he just wasn't able to do it and um we basically with a week before the tour had to figure out what we were going to do and um we considered flying people in to cover for us and um we considered a bunch of different things but when we like put all the logistics together and figured out what it would cost financially and then also the stress of having to have somebody that we'd never toured with come in tour with us and also learn all of our material just like that it was really scary to us and um we decided that the best course of action was for john to pick up bass and um, i've always done backup vocals for the band and i've always done side projects where where i do vocals and it was just like i've been there for every recording session we've ever had I like all the lyrics are you know ingrained in my brain so uh we decided that touring with four people and putting John on bass and me stepping up to fill Trevor's shoes was was the move and um that I was terrified like just completely honestly like Trevor is known for having a commanding stage presence and he is a very talented individual and um I I was I knew the shoes that I had to fill and it was, it was really scary for me. And, um, it was just kind of like getting thrown into the fire. And, you know, the first two shows I had like anxiety attacks before we performed. And I was just like, how am I going to be able to do this for like, you know, weeks on the road, like having an anxiety attack nightly, like I was freaking out. And then like the third show, I like, I caught my wind and like my, my brain, I got into that like flow state where I was able to like get out of my head and like just perform and not think about everything that I was doing in the moment. And once I tasted that, like I, I, I knew that I could do it and, and it, I just had to work on getting, sometimes I, I like, you know, I, even when I practice, like I'm, I'm so in my head that it's, it's hard to, <sighs> I'm sorry, it's hard to, it's kind of hard to, to quantify, but um, it, it's hard to do anything really. Like I, I put myself in these mental boxes that don't really exist. And um, it, it's just overthinking. And, um, you know, I talked to a couple people and they, they, they said the, the term imposter syndrome to me and we kind of got into some deep discussions about it. And, and I realized that that's what I suffer from. It's, it's this 
this feeling or it, it, it's it's when you're like a near professional or you know exactly what how to do something you're really good at it but when the the time comes or or like the the shadows fall you you second guess yourself and you doubt yourself and that that doubt is crippling and it, and it brings you to the point where like you know mind over matter it works both ways like if you believe that you can't do something or if you doubt yourself so you know with your heart if you're doubting yourself like you, you'll fail every single time and um Im imposter syndrome for me was this this moment that i realized that like that's a human experience we all experience that in in some way shape or form whether it's you know in grade school or you know at work or in college or with family you know we we can all relate to times where we felt like we were living a lie or or you know like the the perception of other people of yourself isn't how you feel is yourself you know and i wanted to tell that story through you know several different lenses but i i i'm sorry <laughs> um this is it's something that i'm, I'm i had trouble I have trouble with uh, speaking emotionally sometimes. Like that's why I, I put stuff into songs. But um, imposter syndrome was me, me like acknowledging that for what it was. And and the only way that I would get past that was to put the work in and believe in myself. And um, it's it's something that that literally everybody can can do like whether whatever it is that you want to do whether it's singing or being a doctor or like starting a podcast or interviewing bands or like whatever like you know they say it takes i think it's like a thousand or three thousand hours to master something and i i've definitely put a thousand hours into being a musician but when i was really honest with myself I hadn't put a thousand hours of my hundred percent focus, like my heart into something. And once I made that admiss admission to myself, I couldn't really hide from it anymore. And um, I, I think I'm, I think I'm kind of getting out, <laughs> getting off topic, but that, that in, in a, a giant nutshell is, the inspiration for imposter syndrome it's literally my own feelings of inadequacy and um some of the trauma that i've experienced and um it's just all all that wound up into a ball <laughs> and, and how that makes me feel and how it makes me me and you know sorry that's kind of a long explanation <laughs> No, no, it's completely on topic. Uh, do you think that like uh, coming in terms with that inner saboteur also contributed to the fact that you were uh, able to like stay on the hustle last year so much and stay uh, creative? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's like once I was able to admit that to myself and once I was able to see that for what it was, I was also able to acknowledge all my shortcomings, whether it's just like, you know, issues with my personality down to just like the ways that I spend my time, the ways that I prioritize my time. And, you know, I, I realized that, you know, especially with this Corona stuff and, and knowing that shows could maybe not come back for a long time. And even when they come back, it's probably not going to be what we've grown and known to expect from shows you know it's, it's going to be different and um because of that like it made me really realize that i've taken for granted a lot of the times that i've got to be on stage and i've got to perform and it it made me want to, it lit the fire under my ass to to want to work to to be the best that i can be both as an, a performer and singer and, and vocalist but also like to be the best person that I can be. And, you know, um, it kind of inspired me to start taking these like mental inventories of myself every day and, um, not to get too deep, but like internal perspective is, is, is such a beautiful thing. And, um, it, 
when you when you focus on like the things in life that you're you're grateful for instead of the things that bring you harm or anxiety or stress the the more you're able to focus the the more all those other things just kind of like go away and you know i don't know i still suffer with imposter syndrome it's not something that i'm cured of but i've i took last year to install these new mental processes i guess you could say that instead of beating myself up, I'm, I'm trying to build myself up and, and I'm trying to do that with honest reflection. And, um, I don't know, I, I want to, I want to be able to tell a different story on the next album, you know, like I want to, like, if you go through the lyrics on imposter syndrome, there's a lot of like heavy, heavy stuff in there. And it's all stuff that like I felt and was difficult. It was difficult for me to write about, but like, I want, I don't want like the next album to be more of that. You know, I want, I, I want people to be able to identify with and, and resonate with what I'm writing, but I also want to, to be able to show progress through, through my writing and, and hopes that other people can resonate with that too. And um, I don't know, you know how it is like when you hear a song that's really sad and you resonate with it because it's, you, you felt those feelings, but, and, and that's really great. But like, if you listen to that song every day, it's going to tear you up, you know, and, and there's, a, there's a time and place where you can appreciate those songs for what they are and what they mean to you. But I, I want to, I don't know. I want to change the script if, if that makes sense. Okay. Some, uh, a, a bit more uplifting stuff coming out I, next. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know that I'd say uplifting, but, but, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's been really easy for me to write about, or I, I don't want to say really easy, but it's been easier for me to write about tragedy and things that hurt than it has been to write about things that are positive and um, life changing in a, in a positive way. Um, and I, I don't want to say that I want to shift the tone and, and become something different, but I'd like to be able to be open to those kinds of perspectives in my writing and not just stick to the same kind of narrative always. Of course, you had the personal kind of breakthrough, but uh, as a band, how did you maintain the hustle through the whole year and how was it to publish material in this time? Um, you know... We've always, we've been a band that's done a lot of touring, um, and I, I guess like the last couple albums that we've put out, we we made a big effort to be touring when they came out. But um, it, we definitely wanted to be touring when we dropped this material. That was definitely the plan. But um, it wasn't this devastating blow to us because the kind of touring that we've done in the past. Um, with a few exceptions has mostly been like grinder cut teeth kind of tours where you know we're playing for you know 50 100 200 people not like massive crowds and um, because of that it was almost like we could make more of an effort with our combined attention online um because you know everybody was like distanced from work and stuff too like a couple of our members weren't able to, to go to their jobs and um, they had more time on their hands as well so it was like I don't want to say like if we would have got like a really sweet tour to push imposter syndrome on that would have been awesome um, but I feel like we were able to somewhat mitigate the effects of coronavirus by being able to refocus our attention on pushing stuff online because like when we're on tour, like everything's going so crazy and we're driving, sleeping, playing a show, load in, like it's really hard to even like consistently post stuff on social media. I mean, we do our best, but like um, there's a difference between just like posting stuff casually on tour and like trying to drive sales for, you know, and streaming for a new album or a new record or, you know, whatever. Um, and that's really hard to do from the road. So in that respect, it was, a lot easier to to have a focused push on the the material online at least and i i think that that like benefited us quite a bit uh yeah sorry to uh dwell on the 
COVID stuff, but uh, I, I've i asked this uh, from a lot of bands that uh, from your point of view, how do you think this the, ho- the whole COVID uh, time will change the music industry? And uh, uh, I, I understood that uh, Tulsa is a very important place for you. So have you already seen some effects in there? Yeah, um, it's kind of strange because Tulsa, well, Oklahoma in general, the Midwest is kind of uh, empirically conservative, which is not um, a political view that I really personally resonate with. Um, granted, things have like progressed a lot here in the last 10 years, but it's still like, I mean, they vote conservative pretty much down the line on everything here. And um, because of that, there's like, I mean, there's venues that are open right now and there's shows going on. And I mean, we're not participating in, in that, but Um, you know, I know people that are in cover bands that play out every week right now, and they're relatively unaffected. But I feel like the the uh, original music sector is like very, very affected. And and it's on so many different levels. I mean, the the venues are just fucked right now because they have no money. They have no they have no way to even generate money because you know, all the artists that are doing live streams, I mean, there's a, there's a handful that will connect with um, regional promoters to help promote their, their stuff. But the most, most of them are just doing it themselves and cutting out the middleman. And it's just that there's just not really avenues for venues to make money right now, let alone promoters. I mean, like bands like to, you know, not be stoked with promoters because they make money off of them, but like, you know, they, they provide a service and they're screwed right now too. And uh, it, it, it's not even that, I mean, or additionally, like um, there's, there seems to be this like new kind of accountability for the artists where like, you know, I, I'm sure you've seen like bands that have played shows um, in, in the current times and even some that have followed local guidelines and, um, and uh, what mandate or, you know, whatever. And, and they get dragged online for playing because there's this political divide across, like I said, like here, band, bands are playing shows and, and it sucks and I don't, I don't want to see it. But, you know, it, it's weird because when I was a kid, I went to shows and uh, I remember my first Warped Tour, I got uh, kicked in the stomach during Every Time I Die. And that was it for me. Like I was, I was done for the day. Like it was like the first breakdown and just spin kick right to the stomach, lost the air in my lungs. And like, I, I went to the van and I was like, you guys hit me up when you're done. Like I'm out. And, uh, I never thought about like, I wasn't mad at every time I die because like I got kicked in the stomach, you know, or I, I didn't want to sue the venue or, you know, any, any, I didn't have any accountability for the venue or the or the the artist. Like it was just like I was at Warp Tour for every time I die, and I, 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 it just it comes with the territory, you know. And there's certain things you can do to protect yourself, like standing in the back of the pit, which I did not do, and or or avoiding it altogether. And um, that's how it was when I was a kid, and um, all the shows that I went to, there was no like. I didn't get to meet like census fail when I was a kid, like when I was listening to them, I didn't get to meet like Coheed and Cambria when I was listening to them and I went to their shows, like things have just changed now, you know, like there's, there's guest lists and there's, there's meet and greets and there's backstage passes. And um, it's, it, what has been, I guess the most eye opening for me is that like they're playing shows and then they're getting dragged online for it because people that have an outward perspective and can see things from a different lens are, are, are calling them, are calling them out and they, they should be called out and they should, they should not be playing shows, but it, it's crazy to me because I've never seen that kind of accountability from bands, you know, like, I, I, I think that was kind of a long winded way of, of getting it to it, getting to it. But it, it's like, that used to be something like, like say there was an outbreak and, and somebody played a show, like in my mind, that would be something that like, they get the venue, the venue would be held responsible, at least in the old days, or, or it, it's just weird to me to see that happened and, and to see bands getting canceled for doing things that, you know, I mean, granted, they're stupid, but like, I don't think that they have like 
hate in their heart or they're like purposely trying to like infect people or like deny COVID or I mean I'm obviously there are exemptions there are people that are like that but I don't know I I I sympathize with the people that that I don't know I don't know I I I, I sympathize with the people that don't mean any harm and are just uneducated and just need to be educated. And, you know, I, I believe that if pe people can make mistakes and be educated and they can learn from their mistakes and, you know, when people repeat their mistakes, that's when you, you know, we talk about canceling or like, you know, I'm not going to fuck with that person anymore because they do the same shit all the time. But it's like somebody makes a mistake and, it's not something that's like unforgivable and they can learn from it and they can be better for it. Like I'm all for that. Like I'm all for personal growth. And I, I truly think that it, it's some of the tragedies that we experience in our lifetimes are what mold the character that, that we have, you know, like I, I wouldn't be the person that I am today if I hadn't been through all of the shit that I've been through for better or worse. Um, but there's a lot of better, you know, Let's scoot away from the COVID and uh, let's uh, actually stay in Tulsa. Like, how is the metal scene back there and how has it been? Like, let's link it to, uh, like, the origin story of Outline in Color in uh, 2009. Um, so, like, when we all got together in the beginning, um, we had all been in, in different local bands and we had just, like, played shows with each other in our separate bands, respectively. Uh, you know, like on the same bill or opening for the same band or something. And, um, you know, when you're when you're starting in high school and you're playing in bands with a bunch of people that just like want to be cool because, you know, they're in a band and they just want the attention that comes with that. Um, it takes some time to, to find out um, what people are really serious about being in a band or being in music for the passion and which people are in it for like the perks that come from it. And, um, myself and CJ and Forrest, uh, we kind of identified each other as that member of our respective bands. And, um, CJ and Forrest had just been kind of like making some demos online without vocals. And, uh, I reached out to them and was just like, man, I'm looking to do something for real. Like, I know you guys are in a similar situation because they had they had been in a band that they wanted to be doing more like legitimate things. But it was like half the band was taking it seriously and half of them wasn't. I was in the same situation. So we just kind of teamed up together. And uh, at the time, there was like a pretty strong like metal hardcore scene. Um, what we were doing at the time was like kind of new, like having like uh a at at the time considered like girly singer um with with screaming vocals and like the orchestra and backtracks like it was kind of a new thing so um there was a large metal hardcore scene but i i don't think that we were like immediately accepted into that you know we kind of had to um develop our own little fan base and it started small but um you know we over time built it up it from you know 50 people to a couple hundred people and you know after a couple of years we were you know as a band when, when when we would put together like a local show and we'd get like all of our friend local bands to to open for us you know we, we'd sell out the 500 cap uh venue in in our town which was aside from the ballroom that was like pretty much the biggest thing you can do in tulsa um and uh we kind of grew from the local scene and then started doing regional touring and then eventually national touring. And we kind of, I don't want to say disconnected from the Tulsa scene, but because we were touring so much, we couldn't put like the same kind of love and energy and like face to face promotion that we used to do because back in the day, it was like, we have one show to promote to all of our friends. And then when we started touring, it's like, we have, 30 shows to promote to people we've never met before so it's just it was a lot harder to find the time to go out and flyer and make you know heartfelt posts about you know how excited we were to play our hometown and stuff like that and um so we we were kind of detached from the scene for a few years and then like 2016 2017 we started being based in Tulsa more 
because at certain times throughout the band, like we've had members in Portland, members in Denver, and um, it, it, the band's been kind of all over the place. And now that we're all centrally located again, we've we've kind of got to reemerge into our local scene, and it's been really cool because there's a couple of bands that started when we started and they're still kicking it and now they're like at that place we were at where like they can put on a show and they can sell out the 500 cap room and there, there's like a couple three of those bands and um you know now we get to do cool stuff where you know we'll put on a show at the 500 cap room and we'll put us uh and two other bands that could draw just as many people as us on the same bill no like knowing that any one of us could do you know, a big show on our own. But when we do it together, it's like really special. And, you know, we get everybody comes out of the woodwork and people that haven't gone to shows in a long time come out. And it, it's just a really cool thing to like, it, it really brings me back to the to the early days, like being able to connect with people in my local community on that level. And um, yeah, I, I, I really love Tulsa. And it kind of took me moving around and gaining some perspective um, like living in other places to realize like what a gem Tulsa really is. But um, it, it, it's such a cool city with so much potential. And I mean, Billboard last year, I think said uh, that we were like an emerging music Mecca, which is crazy, you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma, it's like such a, you know, not, not, not a play. I imagine even more so from somebody like you that lives in another country, you probably don't hear too much about Oklahoma, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, from those early days, it's been already over a decade. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, what have for you been the best moments on that journey? Man, there's so many. Um, when when we first started out, um, one of the first places to really catch on and latch on to us was Japan, which is super weird. But we started out on MySpace and um man i i want to say we had just put out our debut ep and um some like name that i can't pronounce dm'd us on myspace and they were just like hey we're from this company in japan and um we're getting requests for your cd like we'd like to import cds to to japan and i was just like what i mean we had just started like we hadn't even sold 100 cds in america and they're asking for us to import 100 cds to japan so it, it was just like this really like definitely the power of the internet and the power of the internet at that time before everything was like monetized for ad gain and and stuff like that like when you posted something and your followers actually saw it but um we looked at their website and they had like you know reputable bands in the scene on their website so we were like all right fine they paid us in full like the retail price for all of our CDs and paid to ship them, which at the time was like 200 US dollars just for the freight on top of buying a hundred CDs at the cost that we were selling them to fans. It was just, we were less like, this is never going to happen again. Like, how are they going to make money on this? And then like two months later, they hit us up and they're like, can we get 150 more? And then 150 more. And eventually they were like, uh, can we, license the cd and start manufacturing it in japan and they asked us to throw in like you know bonus tracks and stuff like that to like make it special for J japan people but it was just like this larger than life like like the first like not real feeling that we ever had an outline and um in 2018 i believe we finally got to go to japan and like um after all those years, we got to to play in front of people that don't speak English, but somehow know all of the lyrics to our songs. And um, man, I, I'd say that that probably takes the cake for like the like going to a place that we've never, ever been before, having people show up there and then them love us and know our new crazy feeling. <laughs> You have listed like uh, rock, metal, new metal, pop, and R and B as the building blocks of your music. So, how did it when you uh, originally got together? How did things kind of you know click eventually? Uh like musically. Yeah, yeah. How did you bring all those things together successfully? <sighs> it, it took a while for us to like re really lean into our sound i think but what how it came together for the ep was we had just been like bouncing around 
like we liked chuggy like metalcore sounds but we also liked really melodic stuff um so we were kind of trying to make a bridge between like heavy and melodic um in in like a, a tone that we all like enjoyed and um man it i mean this was before like attack attack and before of mice and men and um there wasn't like a lot of bands that we could like make a sound that resembled off of you know um but christopher drew put out an ep called eat me while i'm hot i think it was the, either the ep was called eat me while i'm hot or the name of the artist was called eat me while I'm hot but it's christopher drew like uh like the folk singer um and it it's like this the first semblance of post hardcore that i had ever heard that we had ever heard and uh, it was super wild because he recorded all the guitar on an acoustic guitar and then they added distortion to it and all the drums were programmed, I think. So that was kind of um, as shameful as it is to admit. That was like the uh, original inspiration for like the EP and stuff. And then as we started growing, um, we started discovering more bands in the scene like you know, Pierce the Veil and Sleeping with Sirens and uh, Memphis Mayfire especially. And those bands kind of, helped fuel our creativity and helped like help us shape a sound um by by hearing other people that were doing you know a similar thing um it just kind of helped inspire us to keep going and sh continue shaping the sound but the original sound was legitimately inspired by christopher drew <laughs> uh okay uh, we were talking about the biggest moments of uh of the career but you know of course with the good always comes the bad and you already touched a bit on this well you know, basically like uh, lineup changes and, uh, you know, addiction problems and, you know, problems with record labels. They are like the stable of rock and metal bands, but it's not so funny when it happens to you, of course. But what for you has been like the most difficult thing along the way? Um, for me personally, it's it's and I, I'm sure like everybody can relate because everybody thinks that they're the one or that they have something unique or that they could go all the way. But I just, I've always felt like we have had what it takes regard or, you know, we've definitely been closer and farther away over the years. You know, there's been times we've showcased for labels where we were in no way, shape or form ready to sh showcase for labels. And there's times that, um, you know, we, we've been, what we felt was like a fine-tuned well-oiled machine um but we didn't feel like we were getting the opportunities necessarily that and um we always felt like we were kind of like not allowed in the club <laughs> and i'm sure tons and tons of bands can relate to that feeling but you know any of the significant experiences that we we had like you know supporting slaves and um supporting the plot in you and um you know a couple other artists and stuff that that were that had bigger careers than us that it it always felt like surreal when we would get those opportunities because like it wasn't something we were used to getting you know like we weren't we were used to going out and touring on our own name and like taking out bands that were smaller than us or about the same size but would draw a couple kids and collectively you know we could maybe get like a decent show out of the whole bill but like um, any opportunities that we got to support somebody that had a bigger platform than us were few and far between. And um, I don't know, uh, <laughs> there, there's definitely, I mean, we did tours where we were touring on our own name and our van was just like fried the entire tour and we we're just pushing to get home and get through the tour. And um, we've had tours where it's, you know, triple digits and we have no air conditioning i mean i know tons of bands have done that but um yeah like with all the good there's there's bad and um honestly without the bad stuff i don't think that i'd truly be appreciative of all of the, the good stuff that we've got to experience as a as a band you know you see all the time you see signed to fearless records or rise records and they're all of a sudden on the biggest tours and um, they get this kind of like inflated sense of where they're at in their career because they're getting these amazing opportunities that, you know, yeah, they're playing in front of hundreds, maybe thousands of people a night, but their name isn't established to the point where if they put their name on a flyer only, you know, they'd play in front of that many people, you know, and um, that was something that I feel like through our entire career 
is we always are like the the bastard stepchild of the scene or something like people know who we are like i mean not everybody but like you know like we're people have heard our name or like have know a couple songs because we've been around for a long time and um but like we're left out of a lot of conversations it seems <laughs> Okay, so well, the touring has of course changed, but has the has your live changed uh, from the early days? How, and how much? Of course, you are now in the front, but like, uh, do you see like there's that there's been a big change in the live performances? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it, I feel like there's more bands put more of an effort into sounding good now, whereas like in like the early or late two thousands, it was more like huge backdrops and production and flashing lights and i mean they still do that stuff but it was just like wow them with their eyes and like just whatever (laughs) on stage you know and um now it seems that like bands are more focused on like sounding good and and being more rehearsed and and as a musician i think that that's really cool um because like I, I can recall like tours that we we did and well, fuck, we've been guilty of doing tours that we weren't prepared for in our early years as well. Um, I, like, uh, I don't know, like when we first started, we had like huge backline, big speakers like that was like kind of the the look, you know, you got either big scrims or you had big speaker cabinets or, you know, it was like big, big, big. And now it's like everybody uses Kempers and and like they don't even use guitar amps anymore. They just direct their stuff to the board. And some bands don't even have speakers on stage at all. And they're completely like running off of their in-ears and just things have like totally changed. Like it used to be that you wanted to make a statement with the way that your gear looked. And now people are like, let's make a statement with how we play as musicians. Now you're 